so I currently teach junior honors British literature and AP literature. Um, and I have to say, I love my job. It's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, and as you can imagine, we have good and bad days. Um, on our good days, uh, sometimes we're debating uh, how many Geats and Danes did Grendel in fact consume, truly? You know, how many uh, symbols can Nathaniel Hawthorne cram into 10 pages? And, and it's a lot. Uh, you know, we have these moments where I'm telling the students, yes, a panegyric isn't a sandwich. <laughs> uh, it's actually something where, uh, you know, we're speaking to a literary term. Um, so we have these really funny moments. Um, but then we also have days where I can see them looking at the text. I can see that they're checked out. I can see that this passage just isn't doing it for them. So as an educator, I have to ask myself frequently, how do I engage my learners in the text? What are ways in which I can reinvent uh, tales that have been told for hundreds of years now and studied over and over again, analyzed over and over again? How can I make this interesting to my students? Uh, and this is kind of where we're starting to see my ideas with technology come into play. Um, the first question I usually get is, well, what technology are you in fact talking about? Because I, I tend to say higher tech. Um, my school does have a one-to-one -one initiative where we use Chromebooks and the Google Education Suite. Uh, so things are, you know, they're moving along very swiftly. Uh, so I said, can we kind of push the envelope here? So I'll show you uh, two items that I tend to use most frequently. The first one being the Raspberry Pi. Now, probably the first question I get is, uh, oh, is this something that you get to eat in class? Oh, not quite. Uh, but it is something that we get to use regularly, and I think at this point, um, efficiently. Uh, for those of you that don't know what this is, it's a single board computer, and this is a computer. I should have probably had one in my pocket to show you, but it's about the size of a credit card. Uh, the Raspberry Pi Foundation created this in 2012 in order to increase computer literacy um, you know, across the globe. It's very affordable. Um, and I said, this would be wonderful to have in class. Uh, because it's twofold. In a pinch, it works as another computer that uh, I may need to set up and have students work on. Uh, and it also works as something that is very mutable in the sense that we can add hardware and we can work with other sensors and electronics with it. So really starting to change the face of what we are in fact doing in English class. Uh, I had the opportunity, which was wonderful, to actually meet uh, Miss Carrie Ann Philbin She's the head of the educational uh, development team for the Raspberry Pi Foundation. And as she was speaking to her uh, you know, foundation's work and, and how they've been spreading computer literacy, uh, she said something that really struck me. It, it resonated within me. Um, she said, if we can teach our students to creatively problem solve, think of the advancements that they'll make as adults. And that right there, I think taking English class and saying, well, this book doesn't have to be boring. How can we make this so much more interesting? How can we make advancements? How can I tell my students if we can creatively think about this and apply universal themes that have been going on for centuries, how might they then take this into their lives, into college, into adulthood, and say, you know what, I can do this. This does make sense. These ideas do marry because I've seen them work before. The next piece that we do use is uh, the Arduino Uno. This is a little different. While the Raspberry Pi is a computer, the Arduino Uno is a microcontroller. And what this means is I'm not necessarily going to hook it up into a monitor and I'm going to see an, uh, an interface that looks like Windows. What this does, though, is it allows us to incorporate coding. Uh, it allows us to incorporate a bit more robotics. We can work more with LEDs, sensors, motors and perhaps create things that are just so much more um, intuitive, especially to some of the sci-fi texts, and things that are just so much more engaging. Imagine a scenario where, and we're probably going to do this within the next month, I'm going to be teaching Jekyll and Hyde. Well, instead of drawing Jekyll's laboratory, why don't we create it? Why don't we create a high-tech diorama that actually has moving parts? and has LEDs, and they have to argue every single part of that project and explain to me how they understood the text to look this way. So that's where we start to get the text integration into this. Not only are they using um, 
materials that are unfamiliar to them but are teaching them the basic tenets of technology, they're also having to deeply read the text, close read and understand why they're doing the things that they're doing. To give you an idea of kind of how I came about this, uh, in 2012-2013 school year, I had said, you know, I love Minecraft. Maybe the kids will love Minecraft. Why not give it a shot? And I'm sure maybe you've seen things like Minecraft EDU that's come out that give us, you know, teacher controls. You see a lot of it being used in history classes, science, um, all, all across the board. It's very applicable because it's essentially a sandbox environment. Um, this opened up doors for them I don't think they previously even knew <laughs> were possible. Uh, as you see on the screen, what we have here is uh, one of my students decided to create Grendel's mother's cave. Now, you only see the entrance, but underneath was a whole chasm in which the entire text dealing with her, her swamps and the bones and Grendel's head uh, and the bodies of some of the geats down there, it was all laid out. And we got to explore it. Our final project with Minecraft for Lord of the Flies was instead of me saying, hey, can you draw the island on a piece of paper and show me what you're thinking? We got together and created a 3D model of the island and we all got to explore that. And they picked out important pieces of the island and they put in little signs and said, you know, Miss Roman, I liked this part. I liked this part because when I read about Ralph doing this, it really said something to me. And that's amazing. It started to really brighten um, the way they looked at the text. So now we have that. We have that in a virtual environment. The next step naturally for me was saying, well, it's still, this is, this is something on a screen. How do I bring it out of this screen and into their lives? Something where they're manipulating. You know, it's going back blatantly to the idea of constructivism, where students, when they see these ideas come forth, when they see that their hands have created this, we're, we're really hitting upon that idea of agency and ownership. They take ownership of their work and they enjoy it. And of course I want to access that. So using things like the Raspberry Pi and Arduino Uno is starting to give me uh, that, that vehicle, that avenue in which I can really access um, what they truly feel about the work. Uh, so one of the first things that we did with the Raspberry Pi was we created a book-based video game uh, off of Dracula, actually. And I had them create it from the ground up. I said, you're going to code this game. Not only that, you're going to argue to me everything about your choices. Why does Dracula look like that? Why are the sounds in this game um, tonally? Why did you choose this? Because it's great, it's great for tone integration. Um, why did you choose to have this character here and this character not here? Why did you choose to build your housing unit like this? Um, it was super interesting, a lot of different uh, formats. You know, of course we had the game coming out of coffins, we had the game coming out of bats, we had the game coming out of a book, it, it resembled John Harker's diary because Dracula is a epistolary format. Um, but what I really started to see was having the make with the Raspberry Pi in this case was hitting upon a wide swath of my learners. I'm hitting on the auditory, I'm hitting on the kinesthetic. Um, not only that, then they're critically reading because they have to. They're writing for me so much more argument than they would with the standard five paragraph essay. And it's so much more, in some ways, thoughtful for them because they're not realizing that they're doing it. The ownership, again, of their work is forcing them, making them, and making them want to show me what it is that they can make once they have those ideas. Now, one thing I did like with this project is it opened us up to learning about coding. And what you're seeing on the screen is just an example of uh, Scratch, which is event-driven programming using color blocks. Easy, developed by MIT. Um, you know, very young students tend to use this. So I thought it'd be perfect for my mind. You know, 16, 17, 18 year olds, they can definitely do this. Um, and you know, we always have a very interesting kind of conversation where they start to realize that using coding like Scratch or Snap or Python, we're doing the same things that they would have to do in their writing. For those of you that do code, how many times have you seen syntax error pop up on your screen because you've made a mistake? My students are making syntax errors 24-7 in their essays, right? <laughs> and it's, it's about proving that to them, showing them that there, is, there are very definable qualities between coding and the English language, and this opens up the avenue in which to speak to them about that 
We have to talk about word efficiency. We have to talk about word order. We have to talk about debugging, which another way I would call that is proofreading. You know, an error in that code, if you miss a period in your code, it will not work, sometimes, depending on what you're doing. But if you miss a period in your essay and you don't complete that thought, it will not work. So it starts to really open up the conversation of like, these things are intrinsic and we have to pay attention to them because as you go out into the world, sure, you may not remember all of your grammar and mechanics, but it's purposeful, it's useful. These things are necessary in order to convey your ideas and make sense. So that's how we start to marry that idea of grammar, mechanics, diction, syntax. It just, again, repurposes and rewraps what it is that we've been talking about for so long and sometimes begrudgingly. I wanted to give you a look um, at some of the examples of the things that we did. Uh, this is just a picture of the Raspberry Pis where you know, they just have the screen up, but they're using things that are tiny, but we have the ability to put a little touch screen on it and then integrate it into our projects. When I had first assigned this Dracula project, this girl, she loved art. Not necessarily so much the reading, but she loved to draw. She loved video games. The second I told her about this project, I know you can't see it very clearly, but those are three pages. They're almost full. She started drawing all of the characters. She started immediately taking measurements of the pie. She started to construct and make. And she made me a, a full-scale, almost <laughs> giant arcade monitor for this project. And that's all because I had hit upon things that she loved. So the nice thing about this is students can take away things that they love, even if they don't necessarily love the text. This is another project that a student did. Now, <laughs> while the housing unit isn't necessarily quite geared towards Dracula, we did get to see how um, at least this group imagined the pie to work. Uh, they decided that it looked really similar to a movie screen. So why not have their game actually be like a screening of the movie Dracula? And then you, you go and interface with it through that. So I just thought it was just super neat, the fact that they thought of that on their own, um, that they wanted to do that. This student had taken this project home to do it, which in high school is sometimes shocking. Um, <laughs> in my junior, junior honors class recently, what we did was we made a, a handheld Macbeth video game uh, where the students had to shake the Raspberry Pi and pass it around. It turned into a really competitive group game. But what they had to do first was pour through all of Act 1, find their text evidence, argue it to me purposefully well, and then input it into the game. And then all the other students were arguing about the text that they picked. Now, how often are we truly able to get that kind of discussion, that level of analysis, uh, when we're just up there standing and lecturing? So that was something that I loved. Another thing that you're seeing in the um, corner here, we, de we decided to read 1984. And we made the telescreens from 1984. Now think about that for a second. Such an integral part of the text, my students were able to create using motion sensors, a screen. Um, it had it displayed text, you know, Big Brother is watching you. Some of them chose to do different things. We used buzzers, we used LEDs. And they had to argue to me as to why they decided to display this text, why they decided to have the LED burst in Morse code to give us another subliminal message. Uh, you know, things where they're really taking the text and transforming it into something that is far beyond what I could have expected. So that's how I think text, that's how I think technology is so fruitful to integrate into the classroom. It's accessing parts of these students, especially in a literary room, that sometimes really isn't touched upon. I want to talk about this sentence. I had said this as a joke to one of my friends. Um, you know, I'm big on wordplay, as you can imagine. And I said, well, you know, I'm constantly striving to pair literary and the device. And I was like, ha ha, literary and the device. Right? I deal with literary devices all day. I really got stuck on the word device something that is used, something that is an item that is used for a purpose. You know, we usually conceptualize literary device as, you know, um, a sometimes abstract term in which we're discovering what it is the author is actually doing in this text, or what is the authorial intent here. But why can't we redefine our idea of literary device? We have to elevate our student learners. We have to help them better understand how tech integrates into their world, how they may want to use it, and how they can 
take universal themes, concepts, ideas, abstract thought, philosophy, and apply it to hardware. Apply it to coding and get something that is just far more entertaining, interesting, and relevant than they previously thought. Thank you. <laughs>